welcome today we will start with very interesting topic under macroeconomics and that is determining the income and employment now before we begin in the details let's have an overview about the macroeconomic models now as we understood before macroeconomic models talk about theoretical modeling which describe the values of the variables that are there now consider a case where there are multiple variables with me what would happen if I vary all of those? Definitely, if I am changing all of the variables together, my study or my analysis would become very, very complicated. To keep it simple, to keep it simple what I do is, I vary one variable at a time, keeping all the other variables constant. So, as to understand the effect of that variable on the remaining variables and that's what is known as the ceteris paribus. Now this is a condition where you vary one variable and all other values remain constant or they do not change, they remain equal for a very simple purpose. This is a very important assumption, an underlying basic assumption in most of the studies that we would do in macroeconomic and definitely also in microeconomics. The thing is, if I have, let's say, two variables, I vary both of those together, then finding the impact on the next one becomes very, very difficult. So, let's move into the income and employment scenario but before that let's understand the demand and the components of the demand so whenever in the last chapters we have seen on national income accounting whenever we talk about the national income accounting what we take into account is three things the first is the consumption the next is the investment that is going in and the third is the final output of the goods and the services in terms of GDP which is the gross domestic product. So these three are the most important things that we understand under national income accounting. Now what actually do we try to understand? We try to understand this whole aggregate demand concept under two ways. First is exposed and the next is ex ante. Exposed actually means what are you, the actual values that are measured. So exposed measures the actual value. However, when I am talking about ex ante, I am talking about the planned variables. Okay, now how does it actually happened. So the actually what happened is the exposed aggregate demand. Let's say there were 100 units of a commodity A that was sold. Now this 100 units of commodity A that was sold is actual value that was sold and that is exposed. But I believe that there is a vacation season, a festive season coming in. So there would be 200 units that would be sold and that is what is the planned units and that is what is a ex ante demand. Now from a perspective of a business let's say what would actually happen is I need to keep a stock. A stock is an inventory which you expect that this will sell out in a coming duration. So I believe that let's say there is a vacation season coming in, a festive season coming in, my sales would soar up and when I say my sales would jump up, I need to have a stock or an inventory and that is through a planned behavior which is known as ex ante, which is the basic of the aggregate demand. So just to recap again, aggregate demand could be explained under two components, ex Exposed and ex ante. Exposed is actual what happened, and ex ante is what is being planned to happen. Now, aggregate demand. This aggregate demand of the final goods and services flowing into the market consists of ex ante consumption because it's a planned consumption this could be the demand from the consumer side so i am planning my stock based on that 
it's also based on an ex ante investment because i'm trying to invest more that let's say uh, take a simple example of myself let's say i plan to invest for coming 3 months on the videos as of now because i am not sure might be for the next two uh, weeks i am out of town so i won't be able to cover those so what would happen is this is a planned behavior and that's what is an ex ante investment that goes in and the next important thing is the government is spending all of these affect or lead to the aggregate demand of the final goods now whenever there is a rate of increase in the consumption that is there due to a limited increase in the income we say this is the marginal propensity to consume which is denoted as mpc or small c now what actually is this marginal propensity to consume let's say initially i earned 10000 dollars now with this 10000 dollars my spendings let's say or my consumption is uh, 2000 dollars my income increases now my income increases let's say to 20000 dollars it's double however not practical but let's say it increases double now my consumption could become $4000 or could remain $2000 or could jump up to $8000 so that variation that occurs because of the change in the consumption per unit change in the income is explained under the marginal propensity to consume we will go into more details of that in a while before that let's understand a very very simple concept of a consumption function what actually is a consumption function consumption function simply put is a relation between the consumption and an income let's say my job is gone i earn 0 dollars now with this 0 dollar that i am earning now what would be my consumption i cannot say my consumption would go down to zero because at least i will have my livelihood at least if nothing more i would have the basic requirement of food clothing and shelter that would be met so my consumption at any point cannot be zero a very very important and a very very fundamental concept that you need to understand so my consumption the basic amount of consumption which is totally independent of my income is what is known as autonomous consumption and this autonomous consumption is the very important component of my consumption pattern which is solely independent of my income the remaining consumption that i do might be i switch from a two wheeler to a four wheeler so in that case what would happen is that consumption scenario would change with the income so the second component which is the cy component that we have written here that actually means the marginal propensity to consume with the change in the income that is seen and that is your induced com, uh, induced consumption that would be seen so this portion of your consumption pattern is dependent on the income however the other portion is independent of the income scenario clear the next important thing as we said is the marginal propensity to consume a very important concept and therefore i would repeat it again now this marginal propensity to consume can range anywhere between 0 to 1 0 means even if i am increasing my income my livelihood would remain the same i would have no changes on the consumption that i am doing the lifestyle the things that i consume everything remains the same in that case the marginal propensity to consume is definitely zero because my change in the consumption is zero and since we say marginal propensity to consume is the change in the consumption divided by the change in the income since my there is no change in my consumption pattern my marginal propensity to consume would be zero 
the next case is very interesting here what i do is whatever the extra income flows in all of that i spend so i consume all the extra income that is flowing in and that means in that case my marginal propensity to consume turns out to be one so this marginal propensity to consume ranges somewhere between zero and one and that's how we can understand the extent of consumption scenario the next important thing is i have a very simple equation for you let's say my consumption pattern shows 100 plus point, point 0.8 y now in this case this 100 becomes a autonomous consumption that means this is the amount i'm consuming despite of my income if there is no income i would use it might be from the savings that i have if there is no savings also might be i'll have to lend money in order to have this much sustenance but in any case that is my spending or that is my consumption that has to be met okay so that is what is 100 the next is 0.8y now this 0.8y in this case says that let's say 100 is the income that flows in out of that 100 80 is the consumption that goes in and that's a kind of scenario a consumption function which is looked up at a national basis so when we talk about macroeconomics we don't talk about one or two individuals we talk about the economy as a whole a country as a whole and that's a kind of consumption function of an imaginary country that we could understand that has been laid down the next is similar to the marginal propensity to consume we also have a marginal propensity to save now this marginal propensity to save is simply the change in the savings with the change in the income so if my income increases might be my savings increases because i'm not consuming but in the other case if i'm consuming everything my savings would remain unaffected it would be same as before and that's what is the marginal propensity to save so when which is denoted by small s or marginal propensity to save now i can say marginal propensity to consume and marginal propensity to save together would be one because if i am saving i am not uh, if i am saving i am not consuming and if i am consuming i am not saving so it's a kind of balance that i have to maintain on a seesaw so if savings goes up the consumption would uh, decrease or would remain unaffected in that case but in the other scenario when i'm increasing my consumption my savings would go down in either case that's a kind of balance that has to be maintained the next important concept that we understand here is the average propensity to save and average propensity to consume now average propensity to consume is the consumption per unit income average propensity to save is the saving per unit income and that's how we understand the average propensities the next important thing that we try to understand under a consumption function as i said since i have an income consumption graph at any point my consumption cannot be zero very very important so i cannot draw a graph which begins with zero because at least i am consuming something so for a consumption and an income graph that is there i would have a basic autonomous consumption that is there which is denoted by c bar or c hash and this would be my consumption function that would be shown a very very important concept that is there the next thing we come on to is the investment now what is investment investment means a additional stock that you are gain, uh, getting now this could be in the means of machines in the form of labor in the form of uh, roads it could be in any future productive aspect that you are trying to invest and there are changes in the inventories that are associated with it now let's say i take an example of machine now when i have raw material raw material would go into a kind of uh, um, anything that is on a consumption basis would go into the form of raw material but the machine that i am purchasing or procuring 
would not only produce this year it would also produce for next year and it would also produce for further two years down the lane so that would go into the final goods very very important concept to understand it's not part of the raw material so when we talk about machines when we talk about a physical capital that's there it's not just for one year it's not with this lot that is being produced this machinery is gone it would remain for the next set to be produced and for the further next set to be produced so this value of this machine would be part of the final goods and not part of the intermediaries or the raw materials that are there since they are not used in one year simply put the next is this investment decision that takes place is dependent on the market rate of the in uh, of the interest or the rate of the interest that is flowing into the market now this investment let's say i have 20 students who are coming to attend my class on an online lecture or 2000 students but in any case i would have to have an investment on a basic infrastructure for a video setup and a laptop so what does that mean that means that there is a basic investment that is required despite of the fact of the consumption pattern that is taken into account and that is again what is the autonomous investment so that investment i would have to make in either case whether there is one student no student or 2000 students but that basic investment i would ha i will have to make in that scenario and that is the part of the autonomous investment similar to the autonomous consumption that we talked about so we have a graph of autonomous invest uh, the investment that would run in a fashion and this would be the autonomous investment curve that would be shown and this autonomous investment which could be either given or it could be due to an external reason. So it could be exogenous or within the system. That investment in the economy is there and that is autonomous which has to be there despite of the fact of the outputs that are taken into consideration. Now based on these two, we try to understand the income determination in a two sector model. So what actually happens? Consider an economy where there is no government. So if there is no government, what would be the aggregate the ex ante aggregate demand that ex ante aggregate demand would be the sum of the consumption and the investment so my total demand the aggregate demand would be the sum of the consumption that i am doing and the investment that is going in and therefore in order to have this uh, demand that is there i need to understand the autonomous units so what i would understand first of all is the autonomous component of the consumption and the autonomous co component of the investment that flows in so the autonomous component of these two could be written as the combined autonomous sub, uh, the combined autonomous uh, component of the consumption and the investment along with that i would see the variable component of the uh, investment and the consumption that is seen but the the main key component here is i'm trying to do it in such a fashion that my ex ante or my plant supply would equate to the plant demand that is there i supply only that much quantity that is actually demanded into the market it should not be too higher because if the supply is too higher what would happen on the other end is there would be stocks piling up or if there is a very high demand and there is no supply there would be shortage of the production that would be seen so what you have to actually maintain is the aggregate demand and the aggregate supply and that's ex ante in nature because it's plant it's not the actual values you don't know the actual values of, of now you are just planning that this would be my demand and supply pattern now the most important thing we already talked about is the inventory or the stock so what you would try to maintain is a kind of product that is actually not sold into the market so far but you believe that it will it will be sold into the market in the near future and therefore you are trying to stock that up and that's where you talk about the inventory or the stock now whenever there is 
change in inventory we say there is inventory investment that goes in so inventory investment why it is important it takes place because of two reasons first is the most important thing is a firm tries to keep the sales and when you are trying to keep the stocks or the inventory with you you are trying to focus on the investments that could come up so i have a planned inventory as i said a vacation period coming in a festive season coming in so i have a planned inventory with me and because of that planned inventory i have a stock that i keep the next case could be my sales that are for a planned period could be very different from the existing inventories as we mentioned it could be much higher than the inventories let's say i stocked up 100 units but my demand was 200 units so i am running short of 100 units in the other case i stocked up 100 units but the actual demand in the market was only 10 units so now i have an additional 90 units that are a burden to me so that is also a understanding that there are unplanned uh, invest uh, inventory investments that come into play so one is the planned component that you plan based on a season or based on an effect the next is when you are running down or you are adding on to your inventories you have an unplanned inventory uh, in inventory investment that actually comes into play again government has a major role in this how does it actually happen government can control this by taxing so the taxation patterns could change let's say the demand suddenly goes down if the taxes are lowered people would start to spend more so the government in certain fashion manipulates or can control or can affect the spending patterns similarly without a government imposing any kind of let's say indirect taxes or any kind of subsidies the total value of the final goods and services uh, which is in an economy which would be reflected as gdp would be identical to the national income a very very important concept that would help us understand the equilibrium concept in the long run and a short run in our next section that we would be proceeding with focusing on to the equilibrium in the short run and the long run now if we talk about the microeconomic concepts we have seen you have the demand supply uh, intersection and the point where you have the intersection you have the determination of the price that is seen but when we speak about a macroeconomic level we are trying to take two aspects of it or two perspectives of it one is where the price level is fixed the other is where we are trying to allow the price to vary. So those are the two aspects that we try to understand. Now let's say why the price is fixed. Uh, we are assuming that this is an economy where you have lots of resources in the form of machineries, in the form of buildings, labors. So what would happen in this, is, this situation? this situation you would have output that would be produced at each step without actually increasing the marginal cost that is there and therefore we say the price does not actually vary even if the quantity changes so even if my quantity changes there won't be any change in the price because that is something which has already gone into the system and there is no additional further cost that is being incurred onto it so that is one of the primary aspects now what actually happens with the price determination in a macroeconomic scenario so as i said macroeconomic scenario is a composition of consumption and investment whenever there is consumption and investment as we have already discussed there is a proportion of autonomous consumption and an autonomous investment that goes in now this autonomous consumption is the portion that you can see on the graph where you have at least something that you would consume even if your income is zero and this is represented by this intercept similarly you have the line which shows the level of investment or the autonomous investment that is there and this is the minimum investment that would be done in case there is uh, no buyer that is present into the market now when you have a aggregate demand supply and equilibrium so when you 
intersect or combine these two what would happen is you would have the aggregate demand curve that would be seen so in the first case when you had the intercept as om you would see just the uh, uh, the autonomous consumption that is there and then this OJ talks about the autonomous investment when we combine OJ and OM you have the OL which is seen and this is the point where you have the combination of the autonomous consumption and the autonomous investment that is seen and then you calculate the Y which is seen here as the uh, equilibrium level which could be achieved here and this is where you have the change in the aggregate demand and an equilibrium point that has been reached off so when we talk about any scenario which pertains to aggregate demand or supply on the supply side we have price on the vertical axis and quantity on the horizontal axis similarly when i'm talking about the demand side what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to create an aggregate demand function which is parallel to the consumption function that is there that means both of them have the same slope as you can see in this diagram so you have the same slope for the aggregate demand as the aggregate consumption line when we have taken prices as fixed so price level has no no role to play when you are talking about the aggregate con aggregate demand and the consumption curve and when you have taken prices as fixed however when you have changes uh, the effect of changes that are seen now uh, what actually happens with the equilibrium level there are changes in the income and the uh, the investment and the consumption patterns that are seen so let's say in the first case what happens is i have a equation c is equal to 40 plus 0.8 y and investment is 10 now c plus i would be the total uh, value of the equilibrium that would be seen and in that case when i add up all these and i start to calculate y i can say y would be 50 plus 0.8 uh, y that would be seen and therefore I can say y is 250. So when you have the value of this investment that was 10, you had the value of the equilibrium constant that was 250. However, when my value changes to 20, what would happen to my uh, new equilibrium? It would change to 300. So there is one of the lines that is seen here and another line is seen here. And there is a drastic shift. Now, how do we account this shift? We account the shift with a change. And this change is the line uh, Y1, F, and which is greater than the OY. And similarly, E2, Y2, which is greater than the OY2. And this is the change that is greater. So this is the proportion that is added. And whenever we say there is excess demand, that is due to increase in the autonomous expenditure that is seen and that is where i can say that the initial increment in the autonomous expenditure is having a multiplier on the equilibrium where i am talking about the total demands and the output into the system so let's say i have a consumption pattern with the same formula that is given but my uh, investment as i said was 10 and my multiplier is 0.8y now when i have a multiplier of 0.8y what actually happens is with each round my multiplier squares up so it's 0.8 in the first case in the second case it goes out to uh, 0.8 square point, uh, 0.8 cube and so on and so forth till infinity so i have 10 multiplied by 1 plus 0.8 plus 0.8 square plus 0.8 cube and so on till infinity divided by 1 minus 0.8 so that means whenever my investment is 10 what would happen is my multiplier would change and there would be the investment multiplier which would be change in y divided by change in the autonomous perspective and that is 1 upon 1 minus c that is seen so the equilibrium output in the economy is very very under important to understand because this is a level which determines the level of employment when you have other factors of production that are given so when i talk about the full employment level in an economy what actually does the full employment level of an income implies it's the level of the income where all the factors that go into the production pattern have a kind of full employment in the production process and the equilibrium is a point where i say even when there is 
अनएम्प्लॉयमेंट दैट इज प्रेजेंट इन टू द इकोनॉमी देर इज नो इम्पैक्ट ऑन द इनकम लेवल्स एंड दैट इज वेयर वी से इट इज एन इक्विब्रियम सो दिस इक्विब्रियम आउटपुट इफ इट इज लेस देन द एम्प्लॉयमेंट दैट इज सीन इट वुड क्रिएट अ डिफिशियंसी इन द डिमांड वेन द डिमांड इज नॉट इनफ एंड एज अ रिजल्ट यू वुड हैव द इंक्रीज इन द प्राइस दैट वुड बी रजिस्टर्ड इन द लॉन्ग रन हाउ एवर वेन आई से देर इज एन uh equilibrium output which is much higher than the full employment what would happen the demand would be enough and there would be excess demand that would be seen and this excess demand would lead to increase in the price in long run so that is one of the major aspects that we need to understand under multiplier uh, mechanism so what actually happen is the process goes on and on so with the change in the autonomous units of let's say 10 units that are there the change in the equilibrium would be 50 units and the production factors that are going in would eventually affect the output so let's say if there is a decline in the subsidy that is seen a decline in the taxes that would be seen what would happen is that would go either as wages to the laborers it would go as interest to the capital as rent to the land or it could also be left over to the entrepreneur as a profit motive and all this affect the economy but there is definitely a multiplier mechanism that is seen as we explained with this example so with each round there is a kind of autonomous increment that is seen and that autonomous increment is a multiplier so that increases with each round so here we have understood what is the multiplier mechanism a very very important concept with equilibrium which says that even when there are unemployment situations in the economy you would have uh, the economy would be left to its own level of income uh, in the economy or the level of the income in the economy will not change so that's very very important let's talk about one of the very interesting concepts and that is paradox of thrift now if we understand it like this whenever there is a economic downturn that is there what should actually happen is the savings of an individual should cut down because the person would try to maintain the existing level of living or the existing level of consumptions that he maintain and therefore what would happen is there would be there should be a decline in the saving but during the great recession what was observed during the great recession it was observed that the savings of american individuals increased drastically from 2.9% to 5% and this was a significant jump in the terms of savings that was seen why this came up was answered by keynes now keynes while answering this came up to a term which was known as paradox of thrift and this paradox of thrift is one of the most interesting concepts which says that at the individual level the savings increases but what happens at the aggregate level is there is a decline now how does we under, how do we understand this let's say uh, when there is a kind of downturn that is there i would think about saving more money as a result i'll start keeping all the money in the bank so let there be three players individual market and bank so what would happen is my relation with the market would decline and with the bank would increase because now i'm trying to save more of money into the bank now this economic process does not work unless and until there is circulation of money if i am putting all my money as savings in the bank and there is no lending into the market there is no flow of the money that comes in and what should actually be the scenario is my spending should turn out into income for someone else and if that does not turn out the economy does not turn out good so this created a kind of increase in the savings in the bank in short run which became detrimental to the aggregate savings that are seen because the overall flow in the market declines and that results in decreased spending for most of the individuals however if the same money is circulated with the market what would happen there would be increase in the 
uh, flow that would be registered in the market. So under paradox of thrift, what actually happens is during recession, when there should be a decline in the saving, there is actually an increase in the saving. And this increase in the saving affects the aggregate saving at a global level because that declines, which in turn affects or slows down the economy further. So it's a kind of vicious cycle which flows in and it's putting more of petroleum into the fire and it's more of uh, increasing the same issue again and again. I have a very good example for you. Let's say I plan to get a new cooking range for my house. So what I do is I start saving some of the money that I used to go and spend on to the restaurants. Now, when I'm not spending that money into the restaurant, the people employed into the restaurant, uh, the waiters there, the staff there are not getting ample of uh, money that they should. And as a result, what would happen is what they are spending into the market would be cut down. So what actually happens is if the individual starts to cut out their spending, that would lead to increase in the saving for the individual. But at an aggregate level, at a much broader level, we could say there would be fall in the spending that would be seen. And this fall in the spending would affect the economy because as I said, spending of someone is income for the other. So unless and until I go into the restaurant and I spend, what would happen is the staff there won't get the income and if they don't get the income, they won't spend further. So it's a kind of process that moves from one to another to another. So this is one of the very important aspects that you need to understand under paradox of thrift. Also, uh, there was one interesting thing that was registered during the Great Recession period was a lot of people in the age group of 25 to uh, 29 started to accommodate themselves with their parents in order to cut out their spendings and when they were cutting their spendings they were actually increasing their savings so as i said in short run the saving that is increased is detrimental to the economy because the money is not circulating not flowing in and since the money is not flowing it's stagnant it's detrimental for the economy on the other hand what would happen in the long run in long run definitely it would prove beneficial because you have accumulated savings that is there and this accumulated saving would turn into a big capital investment that could be seen and that would give a thrust to the economy further so that those are the kind of things that work around there are a lot of opponents of the paradox of thrift and these opponents basically talk about the same issue that when you are putting the money into the bank you are not just uh, sitting on it you are trying to eventually work around something might be in the long run which could be in the form of uh, capital investment which could be in the form of growth of business expansion of the business that could be seen or uh, it could be in the form of loans that could be provided but uh, it's a kind of very important aspect to understand that what actually comes into play when a recession enters it's whether whether it's good to save or whether it's good to spend so when you have a lot of people saving in money what actually happens is uh, the path to recovery actually gets much more longer and much more difficult and that's one of the key aspects which we are trying to understand today.